The Indo-Pacific Visions vodcast is an official product of the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. The program fosters intellectual, international discourse on a wide array of topics associated with the Indo-Pacific region, including international relations, foreign policy, national security, allies and partners, geoeconomics, military history, and more. It envisions an inclusive Indo-Pacific that spans from the west coasts of the Americas to the eastern shores of Africa, and from Antarctica to the Arctic and covering much of Asia and all of Oceania. Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this vodcast are those of the authors and should not be construed as carrying the official sanction of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, Air Education and Training Command, Air University, or other agencies or departments of the U.S. government or their international equivalents. This is the Indo-Pacific Visions vodcast. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching another video vodcast of the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. Today, we are extremely proud to host Dr. Stephen Robert Nagy, who has been a senior associate professor at the Department of Politics and International Studies at the International Christian University since September 2014. Concurrently, he's a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute, a research fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, a senior fellow with the East Asia Security Center, and a visiting fellow with the Japan Institute for International Affairs. He was selected as a distinguished fellow for the Asia Pacific Foundation from 2017 to 2020. He serves as the director of Policy Institute for the Yokosuka Council of Asia Pacific Studies, where he spearheads the Indo-Pacific Policy Dialogue Series as a governor and as a governor for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Japan. His work has been published extensively across several international journals and has been widely cited. Some of his latest publications include Indo-Pacific Resilience, Prosperity and Stability, Canada's Capabilities-Led Approach to the Strategic Free and Open Indo-Pacific Engagement in Canadian and Japanese FOIP Vision, Policy Perspective, Canadian Global Affairs Institute, Sino-Japanese Reactive Diplomacy, as seen through the interplay of the Belt and Road Initiative and the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Vision in China Report, and Quad Plus, carving out Canada's middle power role in our very own Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs special issue, Quad Plus Form and Substance, Form versus Substance. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagy, for making time out of your busy schedule. We're extremely honored and humbled to have you with us today. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, share some time with you and share some thoughts. Great. Uh, so, Dr. Nagy, I'll just uh, begin with uh, the questions which we have for you today. So, let me begin by first asking you uh, about Japan's vision of Indo-Pacific. So, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is, of course, widely credited for popularizing the term Indo-Pacific in diplomatic lexicon and for shaping a comprehensive and strategic Japanese vision for the region, if I may say so. Now, in view of the fairly recent change in Japan's leadership and the deteriorating security environment, could you tell a bit, tell us a bit about how Japan views its security role in the region, if it is different from what United States expects from it as an ally? And do you see it being further away or closer to what uh, Prime Minister Abe had originally envisaged when he spoke about the confluence of two oceans? This is a really important question, and I think it really dwells upon this idea of, is there a, a distinguishing feature about Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision when compared to, for example, the United States Indo-Pacific strategy? And I think the simple answer is yes. Um, Japan's uh, biggest neighbor is China. Its biggest trading partner is China. Last year, Japan traded about $210 billion of exports with China, uh, and it's Business Federation, the Japanese Business Federation, wants to continue to deal with China in terms of uh, engagement and investment. So uh, based on that, Japan really just, it doesn't have the ability to completely decouple from the Chinese market. Uh, and this is very similar to all of China's neighbors, is that they have very uh, vested interests in that trading relationship, and they benefit from that trading relationship. At the same time, there's extreme challenges in the East China Sea associated with the Senkaku Islands, where um, really daily there's interventions and um, uh, of Chinese merchant vessels or jet, fi jet fighters or um, military vessels. The Taiwan Straits, of course, 
uh, are very critical sea lines of communication that import and ex that are import and export arteries for energy and goods. The South China Sea, of course, is another critical area for the Japanese. And if we look to um, the northern border of India with China, this is also a concern of, of Japan. So Japan's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy or vision really revolves around an engagement process with all the partners within the region. Japan wants to inculcate itself into the political economy of the Indo-Pacific. It wants to be part of institution building. It wants to be part of preserving a rules-based order or renegotiating that re rules-based order in a way that ensures that um, middle and small states are not subject to uh, power or military power. And this is really, really critical. Um, in the future, China will be much bigger than China. It will be much bigger than almost all its neighbors. And Japan wants to ensure that any kind of um, foreign affairs challenges are dealt through international law. So in that sense, uh, the distinguishing feature about Japan's foreign uh, free and open Indo-Pacific vision is tied to the preserving the rule-based order in the maritime domain, but at the same time, uh, engaging in the Indo-Pacific region so that it can constrain China's growth. Uh, I think what further distinguishes the Japanese uh, free and open Indo-Pacific vision is that it's not a zero-sum approach to China. Uh, we still see clear engagement through trade, through environmental cooperation. And I think once the pandemic subsides, we'll see a resumption of education exchanges and other forms of exchanges. Uh, currently, I think the United States uh, Indo-Pacific strategy is largely security focused, and this creates a distinguishing feature from the Japanese uh, free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagi. I think that's definitely a very insightful um, observation of the developments, and I did notice that you've written about this uh, in an article where you spoke about the limits of conflating Japan's um, free and open Indo-Pacific vision as an anti-China containment strategy. And you spoke about the multifaceted nature of Japan's uh, vision, which of course has a crucial economic dimension. So on that note, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how Tokyo views China's economic engagement in the region? Does it see it as a threat? Does it see it as, a, as an opportunity for cooperation? And do you see China's membership in the CPTPP as reducing regional economic tensions or increasing them? Again, this goes back to how Japan is thinking about uh, the Chinese market and where the Chinese market is going in the future. And I think it's useful to think about where China was 40 years ago. It was a very poor country. Um, and today there is about four or 500 middle, uh, million middle class consumers. And those middle class consumers are buying Japanese goods. They're buying goods from Southeast Asia. They're buying goods from India. They're buying goods from South Korea. And they will continue to fuel the growth of all of these economies in the next 10, 20, 30, and maybe 40 years into the future. So in that sense, um, Japan sees China's uh, economy and engagement in the region um, from the viewpoint of a tremendous opportunity to sustain its economy. At the same time, the economic engagement of China through the BRI, as well as trade agreements with Southeast Asia, uh, and other countries are also seen as a challenge uh, in that they're using their economic tools to influence the behavior of Southeast Asian countries. A good, good example of that is in 2014 when the Southeast Asian countries came together for an ASEAN summit to come together to form a code of conduct on, on the South China Sea. What we saw is backdoor diplomacy between our Chinese friends and our Cambodian friends and that was the end of the, the joint commu uh, communique on the, uh, of a code of conduct in the South China Sea. And we see this pattern behavior in, of course, um, the Indo-Pacific region, but we've also seen this in the EU, where um, China's influence with the Greeks uh, and less so with Hungarians has made it difficult to come together on um, a common human rights uh, approach to dealing with China. Uh, so I think that uh, Japan is concerned about losing diplomatic influence in, the, in Southeast Asia and uh, in the broader Indo-Pacific region as China expands its economy. 
Uh, I think also they look at China's engagement through the BRI as a, a geoeconomic strategy to create um, what we call uh, asymmetric dependency, where the Japan, uh, China's trading partners and BRI partners are much more dependent on China than China is dependent on those individual countries. And this will create challenge in terms of uh, autonomous decisions moving forward. Um, and how Japan is dealing with this, again, is through this idea of trying to bolster strategic autonomy of different countries and regions through investment and uh, helping uh, improve intra-regional uh, integration. So I see opportunity in Japan uh, when looking at Chinese behavior and, of course, the challenges of Chinese uh, behavior within the region. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Nagi, if I may request you to elaborate a little bit more um, on Southeast Asia's role in the Indo-Pacific. So we know that Japan has repeatedly acknowledged the centrality of ASEAN as a core component of its vision, but we've also seen uh, the Southeast Asian countries which continue to express apprehension about regional engagement under the Indo-Pacific framework because of the rise in regional tensions as the US-China strategic competition was. So how do you think Japan can maybe encourage more participation from these Southeast Asian countries, given the unique relationship that it shares uh, with these countries as a trustworthy partner? So Japan and how it looks at Southeast Asia, is it's not new. It didn't happen in, under uh, the former Prime Minister Abe's uh, time in power. Since the Meiji Restoration, so since Japan opened up to the outside world as a major exporter and trading partner, in the um, 19th century, Japan has always looked to Southeast Asia as a critical partner for trade, for acquiring resources. Um, and of course, thinking about those critical sea lines of communication, and that has not changed to today. Um, today, Japan looks at Southeast Asia as another uh, production hub. Uh, and what I mean by production hub is that they'll produce things in Southeast Asia for Southeast Asian uh, citizens. They see it as a critical partner in terms of, again, as I mentioned, um, constraining China's behavior in the broader region. And I use the word constrain, not contain. Um, they want to change China, Chinese behavior. Um, they're not interested in containing China because it goes back to my point about the tremendous economic opportunities associated with the Chinese market. So Japan really wants to um, help Southeast Asia and the ASEAN organization be much more strategically autonomous. And in order to do that, that means um, more intra-regional integration. Uh, that means ensuring that uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries are trading with each other and in improving the trade with each other and strengthening and deepening that trade. And Japan is doing this through building infrastructure and connectivity. So we have an, uh, an east-west west corridor from Da Nang to Myanmar. We have a north-south corridor from Hanoi all the way down to southern Vietnam. And we have a southern corridor that uh, skirts around the um, Southeast Asian uh, region. So these are meant to improve um, the region's integration. And the idea is that the more integrated it is, that it can make independent decisions on foreign policy within the region. Sometimes those won't be in line with Japan, but Japan's logic is that more, more often than not, Southeast Asia will probably be in line with Japan's strategic interests if it's more uh, autonomous. And that is why I think Japan has uh, put in its uh, diplomatic uh, blue book in 2018, 19, 20, 21, and, and likely in 22, that ASEAN centrality remains critical to Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And I think this will be critical. Um, adding to this, it's, I think it's important to understand that any of the initiatives that Japan is part of, whether it is the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, the quadrilateral security dialogue, or the resilient supply chain initiative that works with India and Australia, they need to have stakeholder buy-in from Southeast Asia. And in order to do that, they have to be non-securitarized partnerships. They have to provide public goods for the region, and they need to recognize ASEAN centrality. Uh, and with that, uh, I think that Japan will continue to prioritize ASEAN centrality as a key part to its free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And it will continue to try and uh, strengthen um, intra-ASEAN regional integration with that in mind. Definitely. Um, so Dr. Nagy, since you first mentioned Quad, um, and I think this is 
something relevant in which we must discuss, even though it goes slightly beyond maybe the borders of Indo-Pacific specifically, but what is happening in Ukraine? So um, we've seen Japan, US, Australia openly condemning Russia's actions in Ukraine, but India has refrained from doing so, and it has taken what is being described widely as a neutral position and officially as a neutral position. Yet all four countries have acknowledged the broader implications of the, con uh, of the conflict, including, uh, including in the joint statement, which was released by Quad. So could you tell us a little bit about the implication that the conflict may have on Indo-Pacific and whether you see the Ukraine conflict as testing Quad's unity? So I don't think the Ukraine conflict, the invasion of Ukraine, it, it is an invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we don't see the Ukrainians invading Russia. Uh, we see Russians destroying Ukrainian cities and families and homes. Uh, I, I think we should be very clear about this. Uh, I don't think it, it stresses quad unity. And I think India's position is it, it abstained from criticizing the Russians. That doesn't mean that it didn't criticize the Russians at home and in, 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 in private. Uh, the the uh, position the Indians took was related to energy. It was very much related to their dependency on arms and how uh, they're looking at uh, criticizing Russia as potentially affecting their bilateral relationships with China. So I think we really need a nuanced position. Australia, Japan, and the United States seem to understand that. And uh, as a result, I don't think this affects the Quad's unity. That being said, I think the Quad are looking at what's happened with Russia's uh, clear invasion of the Ukraine as uh, a learning lesson of how and how they should be thinking about a potential uh, assertive China within the Indo-Pacific region and how to uh, prevent something similar from happening into the region. Now, the key pressure points that I think the Quad members are thinking about uh, do revolve around the Taiwan Straits. Uh, what would happen if there was a forced reunification of Taiwan? How this would impact supply chains, those critical sea lines of communication? And what would be the best way to push back against that? We can come back to Taiwan, but Taiwan's not the only place that I think the Quad members are thinking about. The Himalayan Plateau represents a critical area of tension uh, and potentially something that could spiral into a broader conflict as well. In May 2020, uh, uh, we had a, 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 a fist battle along the border between uh, Chinese troops and Indian troops. And we see the Chinese continue to test that borderline. The South China Sea also remains a critical area of concern for the Quad members. Uh, in particular, how China is using gray zone operations and um, lawfare to um, challenge uh, smaller countries within the uh, South China Sea and to, I think, create a situation where a conflict could emerge in which um, China would be seen as responding to a smaller, smaller country uh, uh, stepping up or changing the status quo. And I think these are real critical areas of concern for the Quad members, and they're finding out and thinking about ways that they can prevent uh, these kinds of instability from emerging within the region. Uh, so there's a lot of lessons to be learned from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there's a lot of parallels being drawn for the Indo-Pacific region, but I think we should also be clear that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is very different in nature compared to some of the problems in the Indo-Pacific region that I mentioned. Definitely. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Nagy. Um, while we're on the question of Quad, um, if I may ask you uh, your views in terms of how do Southeast Asian nations view Quad and how do the Quad members view Southeast Asian nations' role under a possible Quad Plus arrangement? So I think that um, Southeast Asian countries are, in, they're not united on the Quad. Uh, and I think that they have uh, evolving views about the Quad. If you asked me this question six years ago, I think they would have said, we don't like the Quad. It's primarily a security organization. It's a containment organization. It puts us in a position of choosing between our security or an economy. And as uh, Prime Minister Lee from Singapore has mentioned many times, they, they, they're not in a position to choose between China and, uh, and, and the Quad countries. Uh, 
Today, um, we've seen the Quad really change its position. Security, of course, is a component, but they're involved in what we call public good provision. So um, they've agreed to cooperate in the production of vaccines and distribute those vaccines in India to emerging countries. They've agreed to cooperate in infrastructure connectivity, cybersecurity, uh, to deal with illegal fishing in the Indo-Pacific. And this is the readout from the most uh, recent Quad uh, uh, meeting um, here in Tokyo. And they've agreed to uh, cooperate in different working groups specifically related to technology. So these are all things that I think Southeast Asian countries welcome, and they, they welcome the desecurization of the Quad. Uh, so I, I would look at it this way. The Quad members, um, I think they would prefer a more, more forward-leaning Southeast Asia, quite frankly. Um, but you, you, know, you have to um, work with the people you have and the countries you have. And that means the Quad will continue to try and court and provide for the needs of the Southeast Asian countries. Um, and on an ad hoc basis. Whether they can participate in a quad plus arrangement, I think this is really an open question. I think that, for example, the Philippines and Singapore may be in a better position to cooperate with the quad uh, in a quad plus, um, let's say search and rescue activity or uh, humanitarian uh, assistance and disaster relief activity. But in terms of hard security provision, I think Southeast Asian countries are not um, in a position or uh, are frankly willing to cooperate with the Quad uh, because of the consequences that they would feel would uh, come from uh, their northern neighbor, China. Definitely. Um, so Dr. Nagin, now can we, let's talk a little bit about the economic potential of the Indo-Pacific region. Now the Indo-Pacific economic framework is of course a very recent dev development that's taken place. Uh, but overall, I think you'll agree with me that the progress on this front in terms of harnessing the economic potential of the region has been slow. So what do you think are possible reasons for that? And would you believe that they're structural in nature or because economic considerations have been overshadowed by the security considerations which you were talking about earlier? So when I look at uh, trade and economy, I think that um, the most important partner in the region uh, that countries would like to be uh, much more proactive in trade is, of course, the United States. As the United States stepped away from the comprehensive progressive trans-Pacific partnership under the former president, President Trump, uh, many countries uh, were very concerned, but they moved forward uh, under um, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and they signed the uh, TPP-11. And currently, they're negotiating for the inclusion of South Korea, the UK, um, as you mentioned in your previous question, uh, China and, and Taiwan have also applied. Uh, I think the UK will probably uh, join the, the TPP-11 uh, by the end of the year, South Korea following that. Uh, China and Taiwan's application is a lot more complicated. Uh, I, I don't see it uh, moving forward uh, quickly, if at all. Um, but I think this TPP-11 and its expansion, as well as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership shows that um, trade is the priority of Indo-Pacific countries. Even if they have problems with China, um, they continue to join uh, trading agreements. And here I'm thinking about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which includes South Korea, Japan, and Australia. And the timing was uh, important, you know, um, the South Koreans recently had problems with the Chinese after the installation of THAAD. Our Australian friends are still having problems with our Chinese friends. And just yesterday, um, there was a jet fighter that, um, that uh, had problems with an Australian jet fighter. And uh, they, re they released chaffs into the engines of an Australian fighter. And of course, uh, the embargo against the uh, Australians. And Japan is no stranger to economic coercion from the Chinese, but they still signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And that means trade is the clear priority uh, for the region. But it also suggests that these countries look at trade agreements as important in terms of constraining China's behavior. They wanna wrap the Chinese up in as many trade agreements as possible so that it will shape its behavior in a more positive direction. At the same time, uh, they want to lead uh, the standard setting in the region, and the TPP-11 is a great example of this. The Indo-Pacific economic framework that was announced in Tokyo by the Biden administration is a good start, 
I think it rep represents a new, new um, trend in trade, which is a more mini lateral approach amongst like-minded countries to get incremental progress. Uh, noteworthy was Fiji's admission. Uh, noteworthy was Canada's omission. Uh, and these are different questions, um, but I think any movement on standard setting will be critical to how we think about the region's political economy moving forward. Uh, does Indo-Pacific stakeholders prioritize security over economics? We have to. Security ultimately is the important, most important part for a state, but how we achieve security is a different question. And this is a, a delicate balance between engagement through trade and standard setting, building resilience through things like the Resilient Supply Chain Initiative, but also building deterrence capabilities through agreements like AUKUS or the US-Japan Alliance or the reciprocal access agreements that are uh, increasing in number between Japan uh, and like-minded countries like Australia, the UK, and probably other countries in the coming year. Uh, so, Dr. Nagy, in a recently co-authored piece for the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs, which I encourage our viewers to go watch, it is uh, good to go read because uh, it's open access and it's available on the website. So, there you talk about how artificial intelligence and an increasingly securitized cyberspace will impact how we conceive of great power and leadership. So in this context, if you could tell us a little bit about how cyber competition and cyber conflict is uh, unraveling in the Indo-Pacific and should cyber security, in your opinion, be made an in integral component, to the thickening web of the Indo-Pacific security cooperation? So I think both AI and cybersecurity are really something that we need to be thinking about within this region. I think the AUKUS agreement uh, reflects this. Um, the agreement between the United States, uh, the UK, and Australia focus on AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and hypersonic missile cooperation. It seems that they understand that these are the core technologies that are going to shape the Indo-Pacific region's digital economy, its, its uh, ordinary economy, and, and as well as how states are governed. Uh, AI, for example, uh, can be used to benefit us, but it should be used to benefit us according to a transparent set of rules that apply to everyone, uh, not just citizens, but leaders as well. And here, I think that there are two different views, um, at least two different views. I think um, countries like Japan, India, the United States, Canada, Australia, think that AI should be benefit citizens, but also should protect our privacy and should be used to uh, maximize uh, maximize the prosperity of, of citizens, but at the same time, uh, ensure that there are very strong regulatory mechanisms to uh, prevent AI being used uh, to invade our privacy, to uh, shape our behavior in negative ways. Uh, the other side of this, I think, is looking at how China is developing AI and using it in a social credit system to shape the behavior of its citizens. I think there's very little, um, uh, very little space between uh, the state and citizens. In uh, 2017 and 2018, the Chinese adopted a national intelligence law, as well as a cybersecurity law, basically giving them the right to demand any kind of information from their citizens. Uh, the use of apps to monitor, monitor citizens' behavior, uh, their locations uh, have been accelerated during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it raises serious questions about how AI and the cyber environment are being used to uh, monitor citizens and control citizens. In this sense, I think we have a deep interest uh, working together to ensure that AI and cybersecurity are in line with our values and norms, our democratic systems. And I, I know our democratic systems are all imperfect. Uh, we all have uh, uh, things to improve in our systems, but uh, we want to ensure that uh, these new technologies that emerge are, are not used to uh, control citizens uh, in uh, a totalitarian way. The second point that I want to mention about both of these is the asymmetry in terms of the damage that you can do with these kinds of technologies. What if a non-state actor, a uh, uh, a terrorist group gets a hold of the AI or cybersecurity, what kind of damage can they do to our societies? 
And here, I think that um, both AI and cybersecurity are really game changers in terms of thinking about who can project power, how disrupt disruptive they can be in terms of uh, using these kinds of technologies. And we've got a few hints. Of course, North Korea is a, a very asymmetric power. It has nuclear weapons, but it's very disruptive in terms of cybersecurity and uh, using its um, cyber skills to attack um, uh, banks, to use to steal cryptocurrency, to um, create uh, cyber challenges for all of us. Um, China as well is, is, is doing this. And of course, um, other countries like the United States are doing this as well. Um, so how can non-state actors use these technologies to achieve their, object those, their objectives? is an uh, open question today, but I think it's something that we really, really need to be thinking about because we're so interconnected today and that these technologies are um, pervasive in our societies. Uh, and with that, I think it's really critical for us to be thinking also about um, how AI and, and, and the internet domain in general um, can be weaponized by non-state actors uh, to, it, to create disruptions in our societies that we haven't seen before. Definitely. And, and Dr. Nagy, I think thank you so much for highlighting this point because I do believe this gets lost in the larger discourse um, when we talk about Indo-Pacific, like when we talk about China. I feel like this is a very crucial component which gets lost in the discourse. So thank you so much for highlighting this. Uh, now, as we come to the close of the interview, um, my last question to you, which is self-admittedly quite open-ended, but uh, you talk about a rules-based order. And we've, of course, heard this term a lot when we're talking about the Indo-Pacific. My question to you is, whose rules are these? Like, well, how would you define a rules-based order? Because it's quite vague. And uh, more importantly, how do Southeast Asian nations uh, maybe view this rules-based order? Are there rules aligned to what maybe what the United States considers to be rules? Well, rules aren't concrete and they're not static. And what is interesting when we talk about the rules-based order is that uh, up to now, um, you, know, you know, we've worked together with many countries to create new rules. And let me give, just give you an example. Uh, the new taxation rules on corporations. Um, China has been part of this rules-making process. Uh, the Paris Climate Accords, uh, China was part of this rules-making process. So the argument that China has not been part of making the rules of the current order is nonsensical and it's not evidence-based. Um, it has been part of the rules make, making process. And I think that is really important for us to continue to re reiterate that um, the current rules-based order is always evolving, it's always improving, um, and that uh, many countries should be part of that process. At the same time, we want to ensure that um, some of those rules that were established, such as um, the rules that uh, Sovereign countries shouldn't be invaded, uh, for example, uh, like what we've seen in Russia, uh, in Ukraine, continue to be a core pillar of the current rules-based order. We also want to ensure that um, a, might of, a might is right, Machiavellian approach to uh, changing facts on the ground or in the maritime domain are not the, the new norm in international affairs. So in this sense, some of the rules should be um, amended. Some of the rules should be protected fiercely. And of course, we need to establish new rules. And when I go back to that point about how we use AI in our societies, how we think about cybersecurity, these are new domains that we don't know, well, you know, we don't know how to uh, negotiate yet in our everyday lives and between countries. And we're going to have to have conversations with all countries of how we manage this. So who's, who's rules-based order? It's everybody's rules-based order. Um, but what, it's what I think is clear is that uh, some countries are trying to change aspects of the uh, rules-based order in their favor using force or gray zone operations or lawfare that will be at the expense of other countries. Uh, and I think that is not acceptable. Um, where do Southeast Asian countries fit within this? Uh, I think they fit in the same category as South, South Asian countries like India, Sri Lanka, Nepal. African countries, Middle Eastern countries, they want to ensure that the next rules that emerge um, help them develop, um, help them secure a peace and stability in their societies, 
uh, help ensure that they can be part of the rules-based order um, so that they are also shaping uh, the, how we think about AI or cybersecurity. Um, but I also think that they should be interested in what we call a transparent uh, rules-based process that the same rules apply to, for example, Laos, uh, that apply to the United States, Russia, and China. And that is so critical because if we don't have uh, the same rules applying to all countries, what we'll see is that smaller countries will, um, will be challenged in terms of their sovereignty, in terms of their way of life, in terms of their choices about governance um, by uh, larger states. Uh, and in that sense, I think that um, Southeast Asia shares the same interests of most small and mi middle powered countries like Canada or Japan or Australia, that we want to ensure that um, the same rules apply to all countries. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagi. This was extremely insightful. Um, thank you for your time. And on behalf of the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers and the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs, I thank you once again for joining us today. Uh, it was a great experience and we look forward to hosting you again. Thanks very much. I learned a lot from your questions. And uh, yeah, if anybody has, uh, wants to engage, uh, they can reach me um, online or uh, through you. So thank you very much okay. for this super opportunity to share some ideas. Thank you so much.